Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, our, our live lesson for today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. So for you, that would be lesson 2.01 and 2.02. .02. Um, at the end of the lesson, we'll briefly talk about what um, you should be doing for lesson 2.02. .02, okay, the, the one about ancient Egypt. Okay, um, so just a couple procedures for, for this live lesson. Make sure we are staying focused. Um, please participate when we ask you to. Uh, use the chat for lesson purposes only. Uh, be respectful to one another. If at all possible, please do not leave the session early. If, obviously, if you absolutely have to, then, then you can, but we like to keep everyone here the entire time. And of course, most importantly, make sure that we learn a lot while we are um, in this live lesson. So every live lesson, we like to start with um, the learning goal for this particular lesson, our learning goal is the student will analyze how geography was important for the development of ancient civilizations and explain what the ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians contributed to the development of humans. So um, as you kind of look at what these um, numbers on the scale represent, just think that, you know, to start, it's okay. It's okay if you're a one or if you're a two, um, but hopefully by the end of the lesson today, you'll be up to a three or a four, okay? Three is always kind of our goal to get you at, but if you're at a four, then that's awesome. Um, and, you know, keep on rocking. So we're gonna start right by talking about some of these general qualities of early civilizations. So early civilizations formed around rivers that grew with specific religions, social systems, laws, governments. Um, historians know that these civilizations existed because we have found artifacts, right? We have found written records that kind of indicate what life was like then. The first known written records come from the Sumerians, which was um, part of this region known as Mesopotamia, and they were written on clay tablets. So Mesopotamia literally means the land between two rivers. Um, civilization was located between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, today, that would be modern day Iraq. So it would be located where Iraq is. Um, the land between these two rivers was very fertile. It was very easy to grow crops there. And that's because of the silt or sediment. It acted like a fertilizer. Um, so what would happen is these rivers would flood that water had this great fertilizer in it and would kind of settle onto the ground. And then that ground became excellent for farming and planting. So it made sense that people were going to start their civilization there because it was really easy to grow food. Everybody needs food. Um, so because of this easy to grow kind of area, easy to grow food area, there actually ended up being a surplus of food, more food than, than what was needed. And because of that, people now could do other things besides farming. So before this, if you wanted to survive, you had to farm. That was the only kind of job that was available to you. But now you can go to the market and maybe buy some food and not have to grow it yourself. So because of this, we had things like, you know, architects, um, you know, merchants, things like that, all these, all these um, other careers kind of developed. So there, were, there was irregular flooding, which means that the, the rivers didn't always flood at the exact same time every year. So that became kind of difficult, but what they did is they irrigated. So irrigating really just means that they took these rivers and all along the banks kind of carved little canals or channels where when the river flooded, they would go into those canals and channels and into their fields to help those crops grow, okay? They ended up using those floods to really help benefit them in growing the food. So Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian writing. So Mesopotamia was made um, of regions of that formed Sumer, okay? So it's kind of a bunch of little regions that we'll talk more about in, in, in a minute. Um, Sumerians were an, an advanced society and they developed a writing system. So they recorded information with this writing system about food, about workers, about the different rulers that they had. Their, their writing was known as cuneiform. It's picture-based. So in the upper left corner, you'll see a, a little symbol, right? That symbol might have meant, you know, river. I don't know what it meant, but it might, but it might have been something like that. So every time you saw that symbol, you knew exactly what word they were talking about. This also allows for different um, languages to communicate, right? So if I knew that that was river, that little mark, right? If I was a Spanish speaker, I could look at that mark and say Rio, okay? So I would know that it's the same, the same um, picture means that word across multiple languages. 
So generally only scribes um, were able to read and write languages, but that's okay. That was enough to kind of help spread the message along um, from, to different regions of the, um, of the civilization. So if you were a scribe, that would be one of those specialized jobs, and it was your job to be able to read and write. Not everybody could do it. So the economy in Mesopotamia, when you think about the word economy, we're really just talking about how they made their money. So Sumerians used their land um, to their advantage. They fished, right? That's how a lot of people made their money and got food. They used plants for resources. They raised livestock, right? They domesticated animals, raised livestock. And they traded along the river. Um, most um, Particularly, they produced raw materials and bronze, and they bought copper. They traded for copper with it because that region couldn't grow or couldn't produce copper very well. Okay. Um, so the culture, what were the people like? Sumerians created cities with fortified walls. They built these ziggurats or pyramids and, and monuments. Mesopotamians were polytheistic. Poly means many and theistic means, you know, religion or gods. So they believed in multiple gods. Religion and government were closely tied together. It's not like today where you can be, um, you know, American and, you know, one person could be Presbyterian and someone else could be Catholic, right? Back then, it was all kind of one one entity, right? It was all kind of tied together. So let's talk about these uh, ziggurats of Mesopotamia. It's probably what they're most famous for. Um, they're made of mud bricks. Usually, they were dried in the sun, right? Um, and usually, these these ziggurats were in the center of the city. They were shaped like the bottom part of a pyramid, but there were these steep ramps that would go up along the side um, to the different levels. Uh, usually there were about four levels, um, no windows, right? The very top had the most important structure of this entire monument. And that's kind of where they had a shrine or a temple that was dedicated to one of their gods. Um, an interesting fact is that these weren't the best buildings themselves because they were built with kind of temporary um, structures. So they would actually have to be rebuilt every 100 years or so. They'd start to crumble and fall apart. Um, that's also why there's not really good um, remains of, of ziggurats. If you go um, and tour the areas, right, they're, they're kind of all a mess and falling apart because they didn't have the building materials to make things make things last. So let's look at the social class of Mesopotamia. So at the very top, the most important people were the rulers or religious leaders. And now remember, government rulers and religious leaders are essentially the same because they um, were so inner connected or close together. Right below them are the free men, um, landowners and merchants. Uh, and then below them are the dependents, right? Somebody who worked for someone else. And then at the very bottom, you actually have the slaves. So keep in mind that women were always lower than men in the social class, okay? Um, we're, we're a long way away, unfortunately, for, for equal rights for women. So this was kind of generally the case in Mesopotamia. So if you were a free man, you would have, you know, a, so, a certain level of importance um, in the social structure, but the wife of a free man was always going to be below the free man. So the city-states of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia were kind of divided up into little cities. These cities were essentially acted like mini countries, okay? Now, throughout their history, sometimes those little cities slash countries, these little city-states work together. Sometimes they're at war with each other. So um, what would end up happening is you have a strong leader that would come in and kind of unite a bunch of these cities. But then after they died a generation later, right, they might kind of start to separate again. So throughout their, their history, it kind of goes back and forth as to whether it's more of a united place or kind of a, a disunited place with lots of um, cities kind of acting on their own. So let's look now at some of the important people of Mesopotamia. There's three kind of big ones that stand out. The first one is Hammurabi. Um, he was the ruler of Mesopotamia, and he created a system of laws for fair and consistent justice. Hammurabi's code is what it was called, and it was inscribed on these stone pillars that they would place in the cities. One of the most famous laws that you may have heard of before is an eye for an eye. And what that law basically said is, kind of kind of gross but it says that you know if you if if you gouge someone's eye out like say in a fight or something then they will be able to gouge your eye out as punishment 
Okay. But that can refer to anything, right? You, if you steal money from someone, they can steal money back from you, right? That, that kind of mentality of whatever you do can be done to you. Okay. Um, many of Hammurabi's code has, um, many of the laws have really strict punishments by today's standards. You would, you would be kind of shocked. Okay. In the readings and the modules, it kind of goes through some of, some of those shocking ones. Um, but just know the Hammurabi's code is definitely one of the lasting legacies from Mesopotamia. Um, Gilgamesh was one of the other people known in Mesopotamia. He was the ruler of one of those little city states, um, particularly Uruk, um, and it was the largest city at the time. He built a gigantic brick wall that stood for miles around the city for protection. And that created a period of time in Uruk that was, that was plentiful and insecure. So he really became a hero of the locals and stories were told about him for generations. S some people wrote down those stories and we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest known piece of literature in the human race. So we don't know of a story that was ever written down before this Epic of Gilgamesh. So our last guy is a really fun name, right? Um, Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a ruler that strengthened Mesopotamia. He's one of those people that kind of united a lot of those city states. Um, he was the leader of Mesopotamia at the, the height of its influence, when it was the most powerful. He established Babylon as the capital city, and he attacked neighboring empires in order to gain wealth um, and power. And like I said, he's got a really fun name. So, all right, so let's take a look at some of the questions here um, that might help you understand this, help you through this. So all these are going to be on Mesopotamia that we just talked about. Um, so we're going to start with kind of this fill in the blank. Okay, it says the blank and blank rivers brought rich soil and water to Mesopotamia. So what was the name of those two rivers? It was the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, with inventions such as blank and blank, they grew more crops than needed. What were some of those inventions? One of them we talked about, the other one we didn't, but it's in the readings. So this is with inventions like irrigation and the cedar plow, they grew more crops than they needed. This blank allowed for the population to do other kinds of work. That's a, a surplus. Society grew more complex. A system of blank helped people keep track of what they produced. So it was a system of writing. Good, that, that writing system we talked about. Um, this also led to the development of literature. The blank is the oldest known example, which we just say that was the oldest known example of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it was written in cuneiform, that, that form of writing that used the little pictures. Mesopotamia lacked many important resources, such as trees, right? It's kind of a deserty area. Um, so the people traded the goods that they had for the goods that they needed. Some of the rulers um, were able to to control vast trade routes, right, for, by building their empire. All right, so let's think about some of these questions. List the social status of Mesopotamians from the highest rank to the lowest rank. What did we say? So rulers, freemen, dependents, slaves, rulers, dependents, freemen, slaves, freemen, rulers, slaves, dependents, and dependents, freemen, slaves, and rulers. So I think it's very easy to kind of throw two of these out right away. Um, so if you look, obviously, you know, rulers are going to be at the top and, and, and what's probably going to be at the at the bottom, right, is probably a slave, right? They won't have much, much um, social status at all. So right away, I think we can throw out C and D because A and B are, are really going to be to be um, much more much more obvious, right, that they're the, the ones. So hopefully you guys said A, because the correct answer is A. Okay, how did a surplus of crops lead to a more complex society? People were able to eat a variety of foods. People no longer had to share food. Parts of the population were freed up to do different kinds of work, and people could feed their goats with grain instead of letting them graze. What do we think? Really, it's the parts of the population were freed up to do different kinds of work, right? We could have people could be merchants, right? Fishermen, things like that. Not everybody had to grow crops. So what form of writing is displayed in this image and who invented the writing? So obviously we've only been talking about Mesopotamia or the Sumerians. So those first two that say cuneiform invented by the Egyptians and hieroglyphics invented by the Egyptians, 
we're talking about them next, right? So we haven't even talked about them. So what did we call that writing of the Sumerians or the Mesopotamians? What did we call that writing? We called it cuneiform. So the answer is D. Okay, next question. What key role did the location of the Tigris and the Euphrates River play on the development of Mesopotamia? Mesopotamia was settled between the two rivers to take advantage of the natural barrier produced by the Arabian Desert. Mesopotamia was settled between two rivers to take advantage of the protection provided by the rivers. Mesopotamia was settled between the two rivers to take advantage of the fertile soil produced by floods. Mesopotamia um, was settled between the two rivers to take advantage um, of the, the drinking water produced by the Persian Gulf. Hmm. It's C, right? Mesopotamia was settled between those two rivers to take advantage of the floodwaters, right? That produced the healthy soil that they were able to grow lots of crops with. And then finally it says, which of the following is not paired correctly? Is it Hammurabi had a strict code of laws, most famous for an eye for an eye? Cyprus, a ruthless king who took over Egypt, Asia Minor, and parts of the Indus Valley? Nezakaneber, who ruled Mesopotamia when it was at the height of its power? Or Gilgamesh? a um, powerful ruler who was the subject of the earliest known uh, piece of literature. So the only one we didn't talk about in the reading was Cyprus, although he is in your module readings. Um, and if you look uh, at it, Cyprus was actually a really kind, tolerant ruler. So it's definitely not, not B, okay? All right, so now we're going to kind of switch gears and go to the second part of the topic, which um, lots of kids are a little bit interested in, actually. And that's um, from the Mesopotamia region. We're actually going to go to Egypt or the region of Egypt. Ancient Egypt. Okay, so ancient Egypt um, is another one of the ancient civilizations, and it also kind of grew up by, by a river. Um, in this case, it's the Nile River. So once again, the Nile River floods and it helped kind of grow these crops and it created a surplus and a growth in population. So because of that surplus, people could start doing other jobs and the civilization sprang up, up and down this, this really long uh, river. Um, small kingdoms developed, right? And it kind of was divided in the beginning into two parts. There was upper Egypt and lower Egypt. In the year 3100 BC, King Narmer uh, united the two kingdoms and that becomes the official start of the Egyptian civilization. So you're talking about 5,000 years ago, Egypt kind of developed. Um, Egyptian history is divided into three time periods, okay? And if you look at the little timeline at the top there, it'll kind of tell you. So you have the old kingdom, then that collapses, and then there's a middle kingdom, then that collapses, and then there's the new kingdom, which the new kingdom by our standards is still, still pretty old, okay? Um, but we're gonna kind of talk about the big important accomplishments of each of the three kingdoms. So the things we talk about first is gonna be the oldest stuff and then kind of work our way into the middle kingdom and then the, the more recent of the ancient stuff when you get to the, to the new kingdom, okay? All right, so the old kingdom, what they're most famous for is the thing that Egypt itself is most famous for, right? And that is um, those pyramids, okay? But the old kingdom lasted from two, uh, 2649 BCE to 2150 BCE. You don't have to know those dates, it's fine. Um, the Pharaoh continued to unite um, the country, right? All those little kingdoms into one big one a as a theocrat. So he was actually a religious and political leader. So just like Mesopotamia, where religion and government were kind of intertwined, so was the case here. In fact, these, these Pharaohs, these rulers or kings were believed to be kind of related to the gods, descendants of the gods. So um, you had to really kind of follow their rule. They were literally godlike figures that were on the earth, okay? Um, so these pyramids, when they built them, are actually tombs to these pharaohs, to, to these pharaohs in their afterlife, okay? Monuments for them um, in the afterlife. So let's take a look a little bit about religion in Egypt. There's a lot of people who are very interested in this, but we'll just touch on it a little bit. So it says gods often have the heads of animals and the bodies of humans, okay? The Egyptians believed that the afterlife was really a lot like the everyday world. Um, here are some of the big gods that they worshiped. There's Horus, the, the, guy of the, the god of the sky, Ra, the sun god, Osiris, the god of the underworld, um, Amnon, the god of the air, and Isis is the goddess who made all the crops grow. 
<clears throat> so depending on what their need was, they would pray to the different to the different gods. So the pyramids, they were built as a final resting place for the pharaohs. They were built using advanced engineering and math. They were meant to last, and obviously they did since they're still standing, right? Um, one of the oldest uh, you know, structures that are still completely standing in the world. <clears throat> um, because the pyramids align with the stars above, we know that they were studiers of astronomy, right? Some kids may not know that the, the pyramids actually align to some of the different constellations. Um, so it's really impressive. We know that they really were studiers of, of the stars too. It took 100,000 people to build the Great Pyramids, and it took over 20 years to complete them. And they cost so much money that it actually hurt the economy, right? It was a strain on the country's finances. Egypt at this time had very few slaves. Later on, they have, they have more. But at this time, when they built the pyramids, they have very few slaves. So we know that the pyramids were actually not built by slaves, maybe some, but mostly they were built by farmers, Um during the off season when they weren't growing their crops, they would go build the pyramids. And these free workers were paid um, by giving them food and, and shelter, essentially. So I like these pictures, so I made sure to include them. So, so really um, they would build, they built the Sphinx, okay? Which is kind of just a large statue um, that's carved out of rock and it's meant to guard these pyramids or guard these tombs. But what they do is they built these huge blocks of, of, of cut limestone, right? And they took them from different parts of the country and actually put them on barges and sailed them up the river to where they were building the, the pyramids, okay? So they have these large blocks going up the river so that they can put them onto the, onto the structure that they're building. They made these giant ramps of rubble um, that were you know, piled up around the pyramids so that they could get to the upper level and continue to build them higher and higher so the workers could reach the top. So these teams of workers would drag these big stones Right. And um, on these wooden kind of sleds up to the pyramids and then inside the pyramids, you can see they actually built these tunnels and uh, the Pharaoh's burial chambers are in there that they sealed off with rocks. Now, unfortunately, these weren't very well hidden. Right. Because all of the pyramids tombs inside or all the tombs inside the pyramids were at some point robbed. Right. And, and all the riches and stuff taken out. All right, so after the old kingdom, kind of things kind of collapse, chaos, famine, right? People are starving and Egypt is split again into two kingdoms. If you ever find yourself in a time machine and you go back, um, don't, don't go to that part of ancient Egypt, right? Go to one of the kingdoms. So we're moving on now to the middle kingdom. So we have a new king who kind of comes to power. Um, I'm not sure 100% how to pronounce it. Um, Mentuhotep, um, the second, and he actually reunites Egypt. He's strong and powerful enough where he can kind of take those, those different countries and kind of put them into one ancient kingdom again. So now we have the middle kingdom. In this kingdom, kind of the pharaohs aren't as important as they were um, in the old kingdom. Um, the middle class gets stronger. Women gained more rights in this time, um, and Egypt began to interact with the world, right? And they're not just worried about themselves. Now they're starting to trade with, you know, Mesopotamia, some of the Phoenicians that we'll talk about later, right? So they're, they're starting to kind of spread their wings and, and interact with the world around them. Um, they conquered a land to the south of them, um, Nubia, and that's where they started importing slaves, okay? And they expanded trade in, at the time, too. Papyrus. So papyrus is um, basically a reed that they would pound and flatten until it became really thin. And it created a material that's very similar to paper. It's really the first, the first form of paper. So the Middle Kingdom um, invents paper, essentially. They also streamlined their hieroglyphics, right? One of those, those painting, um, those, those picture-like words um, into something that was much more uh, streamlined, easier to write. Right? It was faster for people to write. But the, the interesting thing is now not only could more people read and write right, because of this new form, but now because they have ink on paper, that paper is transportable. You can move it. So therefore, people's you know, ideas and thoughts could actually be transported from one place to another. Whereas in the past, these hieroglyphics were chiseled into stone, and that stone you don't really move. right? It's that wall or whatever is always there. You have to go to it as opposed to the information coming to you. Okay, so writings being moved and stored, huge advantage and a huge turning point. Okay, um, 
this is also the point where people start writing um, kind of made up stories for the first time. So the Epic of Gilgamesh was basically a true story, but now we have fiction, right? People writing made up stories and reading it just for fun. So then there's another period of time where everything kind of falls apart, right? And now there's another king, uh, or I'm sorry, when, when it falls apart this time, there's um, other countries that come in and, and invade and divide up even further. Like I said, not, not a good time for Egypt. But then um, in 1550 BCE, um, Amros the first reunites Egypt. Once again, there's another strong king or pharaoh that comes in, unites the whole country. And in this time, the new kingdom, you have increased trade. The middle class grows again. Again, there's an increase in slavery. The Egyptians actually conquer more land and end up um, stretching their empire to the biggest it is in, in their history. Um, Egypt becomes wealthy again. So in the new kingdom, they say bye-bye to the pyramids and hello to temples. So the temple of Karnak is one of the most famous um, ancient ruin sites in the world. Um, it is on my list of places to go. Um, it is a com it's complex and it's gotten it's a complex with many interconnected buildings. Um, it's dedicated to the god um, Amnum. Um, it's to this day one of the largest religious complexes ever built. It was um, built at the height of its power um, of Egypt and in the New Kingdom. So some of the the features that are so unique in this structure for and seen for the first time is an obelisk. Those are um, pillars that kind of get smaller as they go up and there's a point at the top. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., um, you can think about uh, the Washington Monument, right? That tall um, pillar that stands in the middle of the National Mall, that's an obelisk. There's a stella, which is a stone slab or pillar with writing carved into it, and there's a colonnade. Colonnades are just really big rows of, of a whole bunch of columns um, that stretch on so here are some pictures of the Temple of Karnak. Um, there's some of those obelisks we were talking about, the colonnade. There's, there's some really impressive statues there, and then some of the um, some of the uh, walls, the, the the stellas that have the little um, chiseled messages and, and hieroglyphics in it. All right. So the last couple things we want to talk about before we um, wrap up Egypt is some of these famous pharaohs of the of the new kingdom. The first one that I'm sure all of you have heard of is King um, King Tut or Tutankhamun. Um, it made the pharaoh or he made he became a pharaoh um, even though he was only nine years old. He died as just a teenager and was buried in an underground tomb. He's really didn't have the most impressive you know reign as a pharaoh. He really um, was kind of an unremarkable but the reason why he's so famous is because whereas almost all the pharaoh's tombs were raided and everything stolen out of it, nobody ever found King Tut's tomb until about 100 years ago. In the 1920s, it was discovered, and all of the original gold and jewels and, and writings on the walls and everything was, was really pristine and untouched. So it became a, a worldwide news story, a phenomenon, right? Um a huge archaeological discovery. So he becomes famous more, you know, thousands of years after his death than he really was um, during his lifetime. So the next fairy I want to talk about is um, Hasputstut. I don't know. Um, it's another one that I don't really know how to pronounce the name. There's a lot of pharaohs, and even as a history teacher, I don't know every single one of them. Um, was the first woman pharaoh. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure I included her, because I think that's important. Um, Interestingly enough, though, she was supposed to just rule temporarily in place of her stepson, who was too young. I think he was like three or four. Um, but instead, she took the power for herself, and she never gave it up, and she became the first woman pharaoh. Not the last one, though. There was actually a couple. Um, but in art, interestingly enough, she's always depicted as a man, um, and that was done just to show that she was powerful. The views back then was that men were powerful, right? And so if she wanted to show herself as a powerful ruler and somebody that couldn't be taken advantage of she was always depicted as a man. All right, Ramses II, one of the, one of the most famous pharaohs, um, if not the most famous pharaoh. He ruled for 66 years. He was famous because of his many building projects, including that picture that you see up there. It's the Temple of Ramses. He um, brought Egypt to the height of its power. He extended Egypt's power far beyond the Nile River, and he had a famous wife that you may have also have heard of, uh, Nefertiti, um, if you've ever watch the mummy movies, then, then you might recognize that too. Um, the next pharaoh we're talking about, um, um, 
Akta Henan, um, changed religion, changed Egypt's religion. So we talked about how they were polytheistic, right? Believing in many gods. And, um, he decided that he only wanted them to worship one God, the sun God. So when Egypt switch switches to a monotheistic religion, right? One God mono, um, it's the first time we know of in history that that's happened. So after he died, the Egyptians destroyed all of his monuments and returned to their old religion. So this was not a decision that stuck. Um, he, they were not happy about it. And as soon as he dies, they go back to the way things always were, right? A polytheistic religion. All right. So let's look at some of the questions we have here for, for ancient Egypt. So why was um, the land of Egypt fertile? It rains every year. All of Egypt is covered with forests. The, um, the yearly floods brought new soil. The many rivers provided water. Much like um, Mesopotamia, right? The, the yearly floods brought that, that sediment, that fertilizer, that new soil and make crops easy to grow. So why was the Pharaoh the supreme leader of Egypt? Was it because he was elected by the people? He was believed to be related to the gods. He was chosen by the elite and he was elected by the gods. Hmm. He was believed to be related to the gods. In order to know when the Nile would flood every year, what did the Egyptians invent? So this is in your reading. We didn't talk about it on the slides, but it's in your modules. Did they invent the pyramids, papyrus, a calendar, or writing? The first calendar comes from, from ancient Egypt, right? So that's, they can kind of tell when the river was going to flood. What helped Egyptians develop astronomy, mathematics, and engineering? Was it the worship of animal-headed gods, the invasion of Nubia, the building of the pyramids, or trading with Mesopotamia? Building the pyramids, right? Remember we talked about how they lined up with the stars. And we also talked about how, you know, for engineering, something that mammoth, right? You're gonna have to be really good at math. So we know that those are that those are um, true of the Egyptians because of the pyramids. So which pharaoh made Egypt's Egyptian religion monotheistic? It was Akhenaten. And then which pharaoh brought Egypt to the height of its power? Ramses II. All right. Which pair of facts below is untrue? So most, so three of them are true. One of them is untrue. What's the one that's untrue? All the kingdoms were polytheistic. The Middle Kingdom invented papyrus. The New Kingdom built the Temple of Karnak and the New Kingdom built the pyramids. It's the Old Kingdom that built the pyramids, right? Remember the pyramids go all the way back to the, to the earliest parts of Egypt. Okay, so we are almost done. And I just wanna quickly talk about assignment 2.02. .02. So the assignment basically says that you've been hired to complete complete an internship at a local historical museum. The museum is creating an exhibit on the ancient river civilizations. You are in charge of the Egypt section of the exhibit. You must decide on the five most important ancient Egyptian contributions and include them in the museum. You can pick any five you want, okay? Anything, maybe ones we talked about in here, ones that's in the reading or both, right? Whichever five you want. It must be, one of them must be something we still use today. So there was a whole bunch of things we talked about that we still use today, right? We still use paper. We still use calendars, right? And there's a there's a few others. Just pick one, okay? Um, you, you must have a written description of what the contribution is and a visual, okay? Written description of what it is and a visual. Visual. <clears throat> Make sure, guys, you include how you would display it in the museum and why you picked it for the museum, okay? So a lot of kids are skipping that. They're just telling me what the contribution is and putting a picture, but they're not telling me how they would display it and why they chose it for the museum, okay? 
If you have any questions, please, please, please reach out to me, okay? And make sure that you are um, texting, emailing me, whatever you need to do, okay? And I'll be glad to help you before you submit it, all right? If you want to use um, one of the web tools that it tells you to on the assignment, you're definitely welcome to do that. If you want to use a PowerPoint, you're definitely welcome to use that. If you use a Google slide, that's fine, but save it as a PDF and then send it to me. Um, I most likely will not be able to access um, your Google slides if you send me just the link, okay? All right, and then finally, we have that scale again, right? Students will analyze how geography was important for the development of ancient civilizations, right? How is geography important? We talked about how they settled no rivers, those rivers flooded, right? Which caused really rich, great soil to grow crops, right? And those surplus of crops allowed people to have all kinds of jobs. And explain the why or what the ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians contributed, right? So like the assignment calls for, right? What things did they contribute to today's society? All right, hopefully guys, if you can do that, then you're probably at a three. Um, some of you may be following me and know exactly what I'm talking about before I even say it, you might be at a four, right? If you're still at a one or two, then you definitely wanna go back through and look at look at those module readings, right? Before you do the, the big assignment, which is 2.06, the, the kind of culminating project for this module, okay? All right, well, thank you guys so much for watching this, this recorded session. Um, and I look forward to doing more of them in the future with you. Have a great day.